Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this. Good morning. Good morning. It's been morning. Good morning. Oh, sorry, I do apologize. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, breakout session uh, entitled The Role of Polish Diaspora in the United Kingdom, uh, in, we will, in which we'll be exploring uh, activities, particularly focusing around cultural, educational activities of the Polish diaspora. Uh, as well as political participation that is kind of emerging from those uh, particular activities that we are uh, increasingly seeing uh, in the life and uh, in the evolution of the uh, Polish community in the UK. Uh, for those of you who uh, haven't had a chance to meet me, my name is Paweł Surowiec, I'm a lecturer at uh, the University of Sheffield. I'm also a member of the steering committee uh, for the Belvedere Forum. Um, and uh, the questions around the uh, role of the Polish diaspora in a public life uh, and a British society uh, are going to help us to explore uh, excellent speakers. Uh, and I will introduce them uh, in the order of, uh, in alphabetical order, starting with Barbara Drozdowicz, um, who is the uh, CEO of East European Research Center in London uh, since 2008. Uh, and she joined this particular uh, organization in 2012, having earlier been involved in the charity sector uh, as a governor and a funding advisor. Uh, Barbara previously worked in Poland in a number of uh, European social inclusion projects, targeting homelessness, uh, as well as other uh, presently uh, socially excluded groups. Uh, in 2019, Barbara graduated from MBA at um, uh, Open University, and her interests align with the very mission of this forum, uh, namely uh, inclusivity and proactive uh, civic society uh, sector. Uh, so, uh, warm welcome to uh, Barbara. Um, second of our speakers is uh, Aga Dichton, who is a uh, a councillor and has been a councillor for the last seven years. She's a deputy mayor and a portfolio holder for community uh, and is responsible for uh, environment, health, community safety and safeguarding, licensing, uh, community cohesion, uh, museum and heritage, uh, as well as big event programs. A third of our speakers is uh, Magda Harvey, uh, who runs uh, a Polish white uh, Eagle Club in uh, Balam, uh, which has become a huge community hub for donations supporting the humanitarian response in Ukraine. The White Eagle Appeal uh, is the largest community-based humanitarian aid donation and delivery operations in the UK. It was born out of the White Eagle Club. Uh, the appeal has grown to a large-scale operations, dispatching uh, up to five uh, heavy goods vehicles a day. As soon as the war on Ukraine broke out, the White Eagle Club put out a request to the community for aid foundations, uh, and which they sorted and delivered to the Ukrainian border using their logistics supplies and already uh, existing and established um, chains uh, that have been developed previously uh, for Polish food uh, import businesses. Uh, Magda has recently been uh, recognized uh, with a Points of Light Award from the Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson during a visit to 10 Downing Street and shared uh, how the White Eagle uh, appeal is contributing to uh, Ukraine uh, humanitarian response. Uh, last but not least, we've got uh, with us uh, Professor Anne White, who is a professor of Polish studies. Uh, and uh, social and political science at the University of College London uh, in a school of uh, Slavonic and East European studies. Uh, her background is in sociology and social anthropology, uh, and she's been conducting her research mostly on Poland, but also on United Kingdom. Uh, she runs an excellent website. To those of you who uh, are not familiar with it, the website is called the Polish Migration Website and has published um, three books as well as numerous um, scholarly articles about uh, migration from to and Poland. Uh, her remarks today are going to be based uh, and she will be drawing from uh, some of her uh, academic uh, studies. So without uh, further ado, warm welcome colleagues. Uh, let's start with uh, Professor uh, Anne White uh, and her opening remarks, um, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to start off by just um, following on from something that Mete said this morning um, about intersectionality. There are so many different people who define themselves as Polish and 
they're young and old and, and they live in London and outside London and they're straight or gay and et cetera, et cetera. They're wealthy or poor. So I think that I'm always rather worried by the term of the Polish diaspora as if it was just one group of people that had a very clear, distinct boundary and a strong sense of solidarity and shared identity because I think that's often not the case and that people are often more conscious of differences rather than similarities. Um, so I think we need to be a bit careful about using that term and sometimes it's better just to talk about Polish people or the Polish population, which is more neutral. But I think we can talk about Polish diaspora organisations because there are organisations that are definitely devoted to building some kind of sense of Polish community and the, um, they, the members tend to define themselves as Polish, except that, of course, um, quite often there are also people involved who um, are perhaps simply the partners of people who are Polish and themselves don't have Polish backgrounds. And I'm thinking in particular of Saturday schools, which I'm going to be talking about now. And I know that Aga also has a Saturday school background. And we have to remember that a lot of people in the, in the UK at the moment um, living in Polish families are living in families where one partner is not Polish. And so there are a lot of children, for example, who have that kind of double background. Um, so I'd like to say a bit about Saturday schools and address some of the questions that Pavel said to us as a panel about activism. <laughs> um, so Saturday schools are um, quite a phenomenon in the UK. Um, there were about 100 in 2004, and then about 100 new ones were founded, including by Aga. So it's been a remarkable kind of feat of many people, and I say people, but mostly women, setting up new schools and also revitalization of the old schools. And um, I've done quite a bit of work on Saturday schools, but I also have been a participant because I've been teaching, well, I was teaching English to adults in Saturday schools from 2009 until the, until the lockdown. Um, but for my book, Polish Families and Migration, um, the first edition, and that was 2010, and the second edition, 2017, I sort of researched them. Then also I um, did a little bit of work with the non-Polish parents, so how they were able to help their children be bilingual in Polish and English. So they're a particular category who are also involved with Saturday schools. But more recently, um, with my colleague from the Institute of Education, so, um, Sarah Young, um, we did a project about the Saturday schools during lockdown, and that's what I want to base some of my comments today about. So Saturday schools during lockdown, we interviewed, or um, Sarah interviewed, um, eight um, Saturday school heads and deputy heads. And I did a very extensive um, sort of examination of their Facebook pages, which is actually really, really revealing and showed that our interviewees have been much too modest because an awful lot of things have been happening that they didn't even tell us about. They were typically very modest. I think this is very, very typical of the kind of situation. These are schools, often with very young children, and the people who run them don't necessarily feel that they're contributing to civil society or whatever, but they are. And, and so this is very important you know, to sort of see how they were able to do that even under very adverse conditions. So Saturday schools teach Polish language, but also often history, geography, religious studies, and so on. But they also have roles as community organizations. So they help create a sense of local community among the people who are involved, the head teacher, typically a woman, the activists, the teachers, typically also women. Um, and they try and get the parents more involved with greater or lesser extent. But getting parents involved, you know, like getting clients involved always is sort of always a bit tricky, isn't it? But then that was also part of the COVID story. So what actually happened, at first it seemed like you know, they, they might become totally invisible, they might have to stop, everybody was in a total state of shock in March 2020. And indeed, quite a few students stopped attending, um, according to an article um, uh, by Potoretska, and maybe half of students stopped attending, although we didn't find that our schools actually were very happy about their attendance. Um, other things that happened was that, um, in common with other languages, Polish really lost out in terms of A-level entries, partly because the um, regular teachers were having such struggles to try and organize A-levels in the mainstream schools that any extra, like heritage schools, somehow were sort of second, made, they, they were sort of you know, put into second place and they were not, often children were not entered. So the, the um, 
entries for Polish but also other minority language A-levels were way, way down in, in 2020. So they were, in the, those sorts of ways, they seemed you know, to be very, very sort of threatened. But at the same time, what was really interesting was the way that actually for certain schools, and I think probably for many schools, this was a very revitalizing and also quite transforming experience. Obviously, the people who were happy to talk to us for our project were people who had a good story to tell. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, what we can you know, sort of generalize from our research, but it did offer interesting insights into what happened. Um, so clearly, some things had to stop. So when schools were, like, using the premises of the local Polish club that was shut, or there was scouting that had to stop because of the lockdown, then these were losses. But there were also extraordinary gains. One was in involving parents, because all the head teachers that we interviewed said that they had made sure that their parents had to, they made a condition that the parents had to be present at the lessons, the online lessons. So immediately you have the parents being more involved. Also, the head teachers had done things like organizing um, assemblies once a week for the parents and the children. So to involve the parents in a new way, not just you know, in the old way, like often parents would be supervising playtime at the school, but actually sort of doing things on more sort of regular basis. And then also the opportunities that an online platform has to showcase children's work. So if you look at these Facebook pages, like a lot of the artwork that the children have been doing, for example, or in the autumn, when the lockdown of, often entailed, um, well, the, some of the children could go back to school to use the regular school premises, but the parents weren't allowed in because of social distancing. So like things like carol concerts and so forth put onto YouTube. So that there was a lot of opportunity for parents and therefore local Polish communities to be somewhat more involved than they had been in the past. But I think what's also very important, crucially, for the head teachers was that they were networking more with each other. So more of a sense of an overall UK Polish Saturday school network because they had to, because you know, the circumstances were such they had to learn from each other. But what really interests me, I think, more than anything, and this is like almost my last point, is the way that the Saturday schools became somewhat delocalized. So in the past, a lot of the activities had been very much on a local level. You would have your lessons once a week. You would have your summer fair, which would also be celebrating Polish Constitution Day or whatever it was. You'd be having various Christmas parties and things like that, inviting maybe you know, members of the local non-Polish uh, community to come and visit and, you know, be engaging in various ways on a local level. But as soon as you get the online potential, then you can start, for example, advertising events in POSC, which can be attended by people living in Newcastle. And so that was what I was finding. Look at these Facebook pages. A lot of things which were actually happening and being organized on a national level or just in other parts of the UK were being, you know, then becoming part of the experience of the children at Saturday schools across the UK. And then, of course, there's Poland. So there are things like, I don't know, like um, free virtual visits to Poznan Zoo. Okay, so you had children sitting in Saturday schools in England being encouraged to go and visit Poznan Zoo. So this kind of transnational kind of experience where the children studying in Saturday schools here, well, so online, but also doing things in Poland. And in fact, two of the people he interviewed were in Poland part of the time and running their Saturday schools here from Poland because that was where they happened to be. So suddenly I think that this is, I think this is enormously strengthening and, and in the past, as I said, maybe people had sort of felt like they weren't that prominent, they weren't so representative of the Polish diaspora, whatever it might be, they're very local, they're all women, but it really helped people somehow spread their wings and, and, and I think there are a lot of gains which um, probably will be fairly permanent as a result of that. I probably overstepped my, uh, overrun my time. It's absolutely so fine. Okay. Uh, Professor White, thank you for your opening remarks. Let's move on to uh, Barbara Drozdovic. Uh, Barbara, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the East European Research Center in the landscape of activities uh, of Polish diaspora? Uh, what exactly do you do? Uh, what is the contribution of the organization that uh, uh, you chair and head uh, to a public life as well as the community uh, of Poles in, in UK and beyond, as I understand? 
Thank you very much. That's that's a very interesting question indeed, because um, this is interesting question. To, this is a difficult question to ask about um, position of East European Resource Center in regards to the diaspora, uh, sort of defined as a, some sort of quite quite a spe specific social concept. Um, East European Resource Center is generally a relatively old organization. Uh, Look, we are going back to <coughs> 1981 when it was Polish refugee group, which was set up by the Polish community for. Solidarity refugees fleeing um, the martial law in, in Poland, or those who were stranded and couldn't return to Poland. Eventually, people were finding themselves on the streets, and this is pretty much where we came in. Um, so that was a few years ago. <clears throat> that that very quickly expanded into what we are now, which is East European Resource Center, um, simply to to reflect that. The Poles really were yet again leading the way in organizing this grass, grassroots um, support in, in, in exer exercising rights that we had for all um, sort of sisters and brothers from Central and Eastern Europe. Because very quickly, was once, 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 once the iron, uh, iron curtain starts to crumble in one place, it sort of went like a domino a little bit there for our user um, sort of group has been enriched by, by, by um, citizens of Czech, Czechoslovakia, um, Hungary, and so on. Then we, we went through a um, period of supporting refugees from Balkan Wars, um, Polish Roma communities fleeing, um, and other, other Western European um, fleeing sort of very difficult for them, transformation of Central Europe. And we reached 2004 when suddenly there was a lot of Poles everywhere. Um, and Eastern European, East European Resource Center has become, uh, once again, really quite firmly Polish organization. Now, as an organization, we are not typical sort of social um, community group or any, uh, uh, we don't provide uh, services that are being provided elsewhere within diaspora movement, broadly speaking, because we, we specialize in legal and crisis intervention, legal advice and advocacy, victim advocacy, and that has always been the case. This is purely in recognition that our minorities, um, especially Polish minority, which is significantly bigger than other European minorities, has always been um, has been deprived of effective support for many, many years. Um, sometimes that might have been the decision made, sort of political decision or moral choice. Um, sometimes that might have been um, lack of resources to support everyone. Um, but be based on this, based on, on, on the work that we are doing, because um, um, we are supporting those who are really disadvantaged, marginalized, socially excluded, sort of politically excluded, also victim of quite a, rather quite heinous crimes as well. We are um, we have insight into the needs of the community that is, maybe are difficult to pro process elsewhere and also bring them out. To the, to the decision makers, which is where our second role comes in, which as an organization we indeed do represent the needs of the most disadvantaged members of our community in front of the national uh, poli uh, policy makers, decision makers, all the way down to regional bodies, um, independent commissioner body offices, um, and um, we work with as much as possible with the grassroots movement as well to reach those who are living in the community who might be excluded from general mainstream communications. Um, what it basically means that it's very interesting insight into how diaspora Polish community, I would say Polish community because I tend to side with Anne on the, the sheer fabulous diversity of the way how we, we exist in Britain. Poles, how we exist in Britain, it's, it's, it's quite, rather quite marvelous how in many ways we participate and we contribute. Um, but we, this, the, this, this, this community, Polish community, has changed interestingly and has been developing rather quite rapidly in, in the way how we take our space in the, the broad spectrum of community participation. And I'm very, very, I'm thrilled to see this because these are not the days anymore that there was a Polish plumber that was supposed to be living, find his place and, and be grateful for the benefit of the, that EU membership gave 
the family to come here and bring economic some sort of betterment to themselves. These are the days where we do speak up on public forum. These are the days when, when I go to public forums and working groups within government or local governments, there are other poles <laughs> who represent other interests. That there might be, they might represent very specific movements. They might specific, uh, represent very specific geographies. So from this point of view, there is a lot of, lot of great work that is being done and wholeheartedly I support that. I'm very looking forward to contributions from, from all of our panel members because we represent this very broad spectrum of, of contributions of the Polish community to Brit Britain. Um, and I will stop talk now because I can talk for three days without taking breath. <laughs> so you have to control me. Uh, well, control is a strong word in this context. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, touching upon a very interesting aspect of the evolution of the Polish community in a sense that initially we kind of thought about you know, my economic migration, and now there's a sense in which Poles increasingly have got the voice and participate uh, in public life. Uh, let's move on to Magda Harvey, uh, whose organization also represents in some ways the product of necessity of a moment in some ways. Uh, Magda, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the activities of the White uh, Eagle Appeal and how they have emerged uh, out of the necessity to basically uh, offer support uh, to uh, Ukrainians, both in Poland uh, as well as in the United Kingdom. Yes, thank you for having me on the panel. Maybe I will start with uh, the fact that uh, in 2004, I have taken over one of the oldest Polish clubs in London. And that was the time, if we talk about the role of the diaspora, Polish, Polish communities, that was the time when the older post-war generation um, started to pass over to younger generations, the Polish clubs that otherwise would be closed. If we are talking about the interest and about what is happening, we can observe for the last 20 years that first, second, third generation of Poles being born in UK, they are losing interest in carrying on the heritage of their parents. And uh, I was one of the first Polish people who got old Polish club into their hands, and that was a kind of the revolution. I was the outsider, and everything what I was trying to do, change, introduce, was really strongly criticized by the older generation. My idea and my perception of the Polish clubs when I came to UK in 91 was that they were open to old immigration, people like me, newcomers. I came in 91, that was the time when people were not really immigrating. I came here completely by chance. I didn't come past the martial law. I didn't come when Poland joined the European Union. I came in between and I was complete outsider. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do when I went to Polish clubs, to <coughs> Ognisko or to Polsk, I thought that I wasn't welcome there. And when I had the opportunity to take the club in Poland, I I got it as one of 20 people who wanted to take running of it because of my position in business. I was known being successful businesswoman and I got the opportunity to do it. And I thought that I can change the world. I thought that I can integrate old, mid-age, young Poles and surprise, surprise, whatever we've been trying, it didn't work. It's really hard to get Poles and build the communities. We are really, really strong. Uh, as individuals, we give a lot of benefits to people who, where we work in our workplaces, but sticking together abroad is really, really hard. Whatever has happened past, after the war, it's not happening now. So this is the one of the sad things that are ha happening in the Polish community and with the Polish clubs. However, our club is very strong and we still got good Polish community and we've got extremely good links with the local community in Balam and in Tuting in South London. So we've got a lot of people who are coming from as far as Croydon, Streatham, Balam, Tuting, where there are a lot of Poles. When war started, I saw on TV the queue at the border of thousands of mother with kids, uh, standing as they are with backpack having nothing. And I thought, God. They just had to flee with nothing. They probably don't even have the spare pair of socks. 
we need to start doing something. We have put innocent post asking for that we are going to do start collection on 27 on Sunday 27th, and uh, we ask Polish media. We, uh, we didn't ask the local media in, in South London, but they picked up our post. And surprise, surprise, when I arrived in the club on Sunday 27th at 9.30, oh, and I forgot about one organization that helped us a lot, the Polish Family Association from Merton. They got involved local dons. And when I arrived at 9.30 on Sunday, uh, I had the part of the parking already with donations were for free vans. And I thought, well, that's a good beginning. When we've opened the doors, but we were supposed to open at 11, we've opened at 9.30, by 11 o'clock, a uh, half of 400 uh, square feet hall was filled up with donations. Uh, at 1.30, I had nervous breakdown, sitting on the first floor, looking from the window, that the queue, people told me the queue was going from the club to Balam Station, and people were queuing up for three hours to give donation. And what happened? The Polish society, Polish community, has managed to bring together all nationalities, uh, and I thought that the people, were, the people who were supporting us, that they were just local people. And when I came out and I started to talk to them, it turned out that we had Polish schools, we had Polish churches who were collecting as far as Scotland, Manchester, Liverpool. They were all bringing bandfuls of donations to us. There was a queue, we caused the huge traffic of humans queuing on the pavement and vans queuing to our car park to donate. And that was something, the most, most beautiful thing that I saw. We got between few hours, we got uh, BBC, <laughs> ITV, Sky News, we got all media. And basically what, what I started by chance was a national call for local communities to join in. And uh, I think we did, the, as, as communities, we did the great job. And if we talk about the role of Poles in spreading the word, I think there is a huge mental and cultural difference between East and West, unfortunately, even though we are all in Europe. And uh, nations like British, French, Dutch, they don't understand what it means not to be free, because they were always free. And Poland, as, as you are aware, has disappeared from the maps of Europe for over 120 years. There were times when Polish kids were not allowed to speak Polish at school. They, they would be whipped for it, and we do remember it. Then we had the war in 1920, then there was a second world war, and we won, yeah? But communism started. And our freedom is only 40 years old. And when people think why Poles are helping Ukrainians so strongly, it is because we know what it means to be under the occupation, we know what the wars are, and we know that Ukrainian freedom is only 30 years old, and that they will fight until the last drop of their blood. What Western mm -hmm. Europe is only starting to realize, well, let's talk about UK. In UK is fully aware what is happening, but the rest of the countries in Western Europe, somehow they don't see that Ukrainians are like a barrier that is defending Europe from Putin's invasion. If we don't support them, Putin will not stop on taking over Donbass. And I think this is the high time more people started to talk about it because politicians are always diplomatic and they really don't talk loud about it. But I think it is our moral duty to keep supporting those people. And what do we see now in the media? Not much. Mm. The, the subject is not hot anymore. People are not talking about the fact that nine million Ukrainians have crossed the border. We don't know how many millions have been displaced. We've got hungry children. We've got children dying of wounds, of burns, and there is shortage of medical aid. There is shortage of food. There is shortage of sleeping bags. Uh, as the organization, White Eagle Appeal, we, we, we called it White Eagle Appeal to slightly separate it from the club because club had to go to, to its normal activities. We created appeal, we registered non-profit organization, but we've been only dealing with the situation for the last four months. And we need more people from the local communities 
to get involved with helping with humanitarian aid. Governments are helping with military, are helping military, but there isn't really organized humanitarian aid. The big organizations, the big charities, no, are very slow. Can I just pause, sure. you, pause you there? Um, what I'm hearing is it's great to have pause around at the time of crisis, uh, which is basically one of the narratives of national identity itself. Uh, can we just move on to uh, our next uh, speaker for her introductory remarks, uh, Aga Dichton. Um, Aga, um, uh, Aga's career uh, and um, uh, trajectory of her uh, migration uh, journey uh, speaks to a very different aspect of uh, political participation uh, than humanitarian aid. Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about uh, your journey into becoming uh, a counselor and how has your trajectory uh, evolved from educational activities into becoming uh, an activist, uh, a candidate for a public office, and then finally a councillor? Uh, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Pavel. I'm very sorry, air condition is not my friend. Mm -hmm. So uh, my voice is a bit creaky, please forgive me. <laughs> Uh, Professor Am, um, thank you very much for your kind word. It's exactly where I started. Uh, 15 years ago, I decided let's move to UK, why not? I have something more, I want to give to something different to my children, let's go abroad. We did. Back to Poland, I knew that um, I need to open Polish Saturday <laughs> school just because it's so important to have a good understanding for your children, their heritage and their background. And thinking to move abroad, you know that your children won't be any more that connected with Poland, Polish culture and tradition. So that was the reason why I decided to open a Polish Saturday school. And indeed, it was a women's. <laughs> um, not long after, I was approached by uh, a local uh, councillors and uh, Mers in Watford, who was quite interested to learn more about Polish community, aspiration, the fact that it's quite young uh, Saturday schools across many different communities in the town. And this is how my journey started. Um, one day I was asked what I consider, and I thought, me? Nah. Then I spoke with my husband and said, well, you. Yeah, why not? You just go for it. You have nothing to lose. Let's stand and see what happens. And probably now he regrets that what he said seven years ago, <laughs> because it seems like I quite enjoying my role to helping and supporting uh, other communities, uh, um, help understand other people to engage with politics, with community, and uh, keep encouraging them to do so. I did not plan to be a deputy mayor. It was something what, again, just happened, uh, which I really, really um, honored to be. It's a huge responsibility, uh, but I feel that it's a great opportunity for young uh, European who would like to uh, see themselves in politics or community purpose for the future to show that whatever you're thinking of, you can achieve it. It's just uh, the way how you want to approach it and where you would like to start. Uh, keep it short. Um, that's, the, that's the way how I end up in a position where I'm right now. I was just re-elected uh, in May for another four years with uh, a huge majority of uh, 600 votes, uh, which again, uh, I'm really uh, honored. Uh, to have recognition through Watford residents and community that they can see as someone who is not British, who is European and perhaps is woman, and uh, is mum and wife, uh, can represent them not only in a chamber but also across the whole country. Just recently I had uh, opportunities to participate in a very interesting webinar organized by a local government association, be a councillor, where I talked to over 100 uh, people who are interested in the future to be a councillor or perhaps start their journey with community interest. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you for uh, those opening remarks. 
Um, I also would like to kind of look at the Polish community from a perspective of its own self-definition uh, and self-awareness, if I may. Um, and two major international events that impacted not obviously on the Polish community, but communities internationally, both in uh, UK, across the uh, world as well, uh, were Brexit uh, and COVID. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to ask about your thoughts, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, how has Brexit and COVID uh, helped to reshape um, the Polish diaspora in terms of not only activities, because uncovered uh, activities to a certain extent, but, uh, but its own self-identity <laughs> and ways in which Poles increasingly either feel pressurized or are having to make choices that previously didn't have to make. Uh, and Anne obviously spoke about intersectionality, which is quite uh, fascinating in the context of, of, of this question. Um, would you mind sharing your thoughts on, on that? Should I start? Sure, okay. please do. Okay, so I just want to say about Brexit. I mean, obviously Brexit um, had the effect of making people recognise often that they did want to be settled in the UK, and many families had already been coming to that conclusion. But I suppose with the Saturday schools, it just sort of reinforced the idea for many of the people living locally that they, you know, the UK was their home now. Um, so I think Brexit is quite an important kind of background to the Saturday schools and where they sit because they are, they are definitely, or well, they seem to be more sort of becoming increasingly um, immersed in the local society, particularly had more and more children attending, had one non-Polish parent, which wasn't the case in, say, 2009. Um, so that, so, that, so that, that from that point of view, but then, as I said, I think what was interesting in the, in the, in, during the pandemic was, was that they began in many ways being more linked up to Poland <laughs> So, so that they, then you get the kind of reverse uh, thing. So even though people were not, families were not resettling back in Poland, there wasn't a mass wave of returns. Still, there was a sense of being connected up with people in Poland and doing similar kinds of activities. I think with the COVID, what I wanted to say was, I think from looking at it from the point of view of civil society, it did operate on various different levels that COVID brought out in the schools kind of sense of civic responsibility um, locally, but also internationally. So for example, what you had was, children doing various kinds of like voluntary work as well. Like there was one school where they made Christmas cards for a care home in the UK and a care home in Poland. So there what you've got is the transnational thing helping Poland, UK thing helping in the UK, but then also just the, the whole sort of sense of the children being encouraged to sort of feel that they're doing something which is behaving as responsible citizens and taking an interest and, and, and sort of generally trying to support uh, you know, everybody, as it were. Another example would be where uh, a, a local Polish doctor working in a hospital um, made a short video for the Saturday school children about his work in a COVID ward. So, you know, again, the, the COVID gives the opportunity, perhaps, but you could put it like that, for the children to feel they're part of something bigger, something where they all have a role to play. They have to be careful, they have to be informed. Um, and the Saturday school is taking on that role, which is really about bringing up children to be socially responsible. It's not just about teaching Polish language. Okay, uh, fantastic. Uh, Barbara, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you work within a broader Eastern European communities. I mean, how do Poles working alongside you uh, redefine their identity uh, in the interaction with the broader Eastern European communities well, that your organization is helping? This is quite interesting, actually. I, I just wanted, I was just reflecting on this. Uh, I was just thinking that this is my third Belvedere panel in my life. The first one was just after, just at the beginning of Belvedere Forum, or just after the referendum. And I remember I was speaking about just the subject when, when, the, when we, were, we were in shock as a community. There was a, a lot of really sort of feeling of betrayal, betrayal. We were sort of those, those, those roots that the community was slowly establishing were just ripped out. And, and we, just, we were discussing basically how do we defend Polish community from hostility that might be brought about by the process of Brexit. No <coughs> one knew anything. Later, a couple of years later, I was speaking about um, defending rights of Poles in the process of Brexit, but that was the stage when 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 the mood settled a little bit, and we could we were we were out out of this sort of complete survival mode as a community. We were at the stage of let's at least make sure that we are not being harmed in the process of Brexit. And now today we are sitting here, and I'm kind of con reflecting on the fact that. This, this, this quite interesting process of, of, of UK leaving EU, 
uh, really has, in my view, been quite beneficial for the Polish community. I mean, in general terms for European communities, but Polish community in particular. And I'm also saying that as a Polish, <laughs> as a Polish expat, obviously. Uh, one thing is that the word that I used there, expat, at the beginning, at the, at the point of referendum, we were migrants and, and the French were expats. Now we are not anymore and no one really is. We are Poles who live in Britain and this is what we are. And, um, and what, what also, and, and, the, and what, what the Brexit opened up was some, some kind of, um, the, this, this sort of really silent issues that have always been the problem within the Polish community, such as labor exploitation, or really, really poor housing quality, or, or hate crime and hate incidents. But the, the difficulty to break through with discussing these things when it comes to European community population, especially the one that that has a that used to have very strong kind of signature of economic labor, is very difficult in in general general terms. This is why Brexit actually opened up open that Pandora box for us. And I will be, and this is, if there is one good thing, um, regardless of what we think about Brexit, there definitely is. Now, what happened with COVID is that once we have sort of become, we have started becoming <laughs> sort of minority, I think minority rather than economic migrants. Economic migrants always in, implies an element of human resource that is being shipped in and out, while economic minority, uh, sorry, ethnic minority is an ethnic minority which has its place in the whole society. The question that is, that, that is emerging here is what is the position, what, what, where do we sit in this sort of, in this, in this is bigger scheme of British things? Um, and I think that COVID, what it did, was that that grassroots movements that has emerged, uh, much obviously, uh, uh, huge, um, huge grassroots that has been bef just before referendum already, it, it just got strengthened and it em emerged and into the ma um, mainstream, just like Anne says, those those are those those uh, neighborhood kind of uh, support systems that existed. That, that were created around COVID. They kind of moved in together with the general COVID sort of community support systems. And I think that to a large extent stayed there. So it, 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 is, it is definitely outward looking to certain extent activity, activism and participation, which is a good sign of of integration rather than survival. This is how I see it from a sort of anthropological and political point of view. Um, and I think that this is where we are going. So the next step, just to close, to close this, would be an outright political uh, participation that quite often, hopefully, is coming after this um, participation on the kind of social community level, uh, which I would be quite interested to know if Aga is seeing. Okay. Uh... Uh, Magda, uh, what are your thoughts on ways in which Brexit and uh, pandemic uh, redefined the identity and self-awareness of Poles in the well, UK? Then, you know, when we were told, when we were told uh, years ago when Brexit happened, I was invited on Newsnight and I was almost crucified for the fact that Poles were stealing the jobs and I was trying to explain that Eastern Europeans are feeling the jobs that are not wanted by British. and. Uh, it has been proven after Brexit that we get tens of calls. As a Polish club, do we know anybody who is looking for a job because there is uh, somebody required in the nursing home or they are looking for nurses mm. or laborers? So we can see that definitely Eastern Europeans were not the problem with stealing the jobs. That is what Brexit has proven definitely. Uh, with COVID, what I, uh, what I observed was that uh, and what, what happened with Brexit, a lot of Poles have left. And I could even see with my employees. They have packed up their families, their lives from here, and they decided to go back to Poland because they felt unwelcome, especially those people who are here for less than five years. Okay. And uh, with COVID, what happened? Again, uh, we were one of the nation on top of all other wonderful people who were helping, but we were one of those 
who in local communities, we've organized the help and we were taking the food parcels and necessity to older citizens. We were not looking, first of all, obviously we started with helping Poles and it wasn't just the club in Balan or Molten Nights, but they were all other, they were all other Polish clubs helping. But what happened really quickly, that <coughs> we were seen as the nation who is looking after all the neighbors, no matter what nationalities they are. So I think that was where, where Poles are being seen as the valuable part of the local communities. Okay, fantastic. And um, okay, you kind of represent a very particular uh, and interesting case because to a certain extent, by the virtue of uh, being elected official, mm -hmm. you kind of have to rely on a delicate balance of appealing to both British community as well as the Polish community. I mean, how do you strike this balance even in your approach to campaigning activities? I mean, do, do you play the identity card a little bit or do you see that as uh, being important in uh, political campaigning? Uh, it's uh, uh, worth it to say and really important to, to start saying that I'm Polish and I'm very proud of it. And this is the statement when I always open it, having a conversation about Brexit. Uh, what's happened uh, as, as <laughs> Brexit is very, uh, I can talk about Brexit from political point of view. I can talk about Brexit from a residential point of view. Sure. I can talk about Brexit from community point of view as a representative. Mm -hmm. Brexit unfortunately happened and it's no point to coming back to it because it's done. But what it did in communities in general and what brought to us as a residents of England a lot of challenges which no one was uh, ready to accept and take on shoulders. Unfortunately, it made lots of Polish families and communities and European families to leave. It brought lots of advantages, which they are still facing on a daily basis. And uh, the reality is that we cannot move forward without additional input, and we will be have more to add to try find the balance from political point of view. What COVID showed us in this unprecedented time when no one expected that actually we will face a pandemic in 21st century. It brought community together um, in Watford and across Hull County. Um, Poles, alongside with other community groups, joined together, organized uh, groups, organized support to each other, uh, look after local residents, look after vulnerable residents, so what, what COVID brought to community, joined a partnership together and soiled them even more than before. In Watford particularly, uh, Brexit really did the same. They solid community. Even so, through referendum, Watford voted to leave just by 3%, but they voted to leave. They approached myself on the doorstep was, we don't care who you are. We are proud that you're European. We are proud that you're representing us and we will be always standing behind you because you're one of us. It doesn't matter what color of passport you have. And I think that's the message in general to everyone, to think about who you are, not what color of passport you have and what you can bring to community because we are in one society. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, as we kind of approach it from a slightly broader uh, perspective, the, the, the topic of the uh, Polish diaspora uh, in the UK, uh, can I just move on to um, the more specific activities that uh, caught your attention and caught your eyes as kind of defining new activities and acts of activism of the Polish diaspora since the last forum, since uh, 2021? Uh, is there anything in particular uh, that you've noticed that Polish community in UK has been active, uh, both in terms of education and, and broader activism. Um, Professor White, would you like to start? Uh, no, it's hard for me to answer that because I've been living in Poland almost the entire time. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, fine, that's yeah. a perfectly valid answer. Um, Barbara, uh, is there anything that kind of caught your eye in terms of uh, 
uh, specific new areas of uh, activism or educational activity, uh, activities of... Uh well, there is one thing that, that I have noticed that, 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 that is sort of leading, uh, kind of, uh, leading to, to, um, to my previous remarks about political activism, which is, for example, activities around voter registration, which is something quite unique for British political voting system, which is we don't obviously have in Poland. You, you don't need to register to vote. You are registered where you live. Well, we, uh, this is one of the things that, um, that is um, int interestingly very often led by young, young Poles. I mean, young sort of people uh, younger than 40. <laughs> <laughs> so young Poles. Um, and, but this is, this is one of those sort of signs that this is where, this is where the full integration, full, full political social integration is leading. And I'll leave that on this remark because that was, that this is rather something that I find quite new quality. Okay. Uh, Magda? I haven't noticed any new activities, sorry. There's you haven't? Okay. Okay. <laughs> that, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Agabar, what about yourself? I mean, again, you, you kind of can be an inspirational figure to uh, both uh, Poles themselves, young women uh, who are thinking about uh, uh, participating in politics or embarking on political careers. Uh, uh, is that uh, something that you have been thinking about, uh, perhaps engaging with a little bit? I know that you ask, <coughs> excuse me, what's happened since last forum, so we're talking sure. about only a year, but I can see movements since 2018 after referendum. Okay. You, people and communities had that choice to either do something about it mm -hmm. or not do anything about it, move back and forget. Uh, and since 2018, communities and individuals who decided to do more about it and talk about it and be the first one to speak about it, they are talking, they are engaging, they are communicating, contacting with myself, asking what we can do, how we can do it, uh, how we can support others, where we should start. And particular in the last year, polls, definitely engaging more in local community to try and find the roots, how to create one community and understand each other better, because I think that's the, that, that, that's the powerful story about society. We are living one in this, and we want to make it life better. So instead of doing separate as a little group, we want to do things together. What is challenging and difficult to understanding your individual heritage and your uh, identity as a small group across the whole group uh, and community in one place, town or city, wherever you live. But it's definitely something what, what uh, Paul's working towards to make it that one big uh, community working together and try supporting each other by networking sessions organized locally, but like we have today um, across the whole country which is wonderful. It's definitely something what we should do more. We should be more active now, post-COVID, let's hope that it's gone. Well, considering that the rise is going up, uh, we can absolutely talk about it. And, and if you do not talk about it, and I will encourage all of you, if you do not talk about it, if you do not asking sometimes challenging questions, not difficult, challenging, you never know what actually people are thinking. And perhaps in your organization, community place where you live, you will have the same one person who would like to start something a little bit more, just need, need a little bit of encouragement. So I can see that movement going in the right direction. They want to communicate, they want to engage, but sometimes they need that little bit of... Impulse. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, fantastic. On that note, uh, Let's uh, open this discussion to uh, our audience, both here in the room as well as uh, online. Uh, just wanted to remind you that we are live streamed uh, and we might get some questions from the uh, virtual audience. Um, who would like to start? Okay, uh, let's start with Mikolai. Uh, uh, Mikolai Kuniski, uh, Polish University Abroad and University of Wrocław. Um, I've got a question for all panelists, actually, and then something uh, separate for Anne White. Um, the first question um, uh, has to do with the title of the, of, the, of the panel. So the role of the Polish diaspora, and we already decided that it's better to use the word for Polish people in the UK. And uh, interestingly enough, um, 
we've got basically you, so there is a sector of charity, there is a sector of NGOs, um, local government, and to some extent, if we look at Anne, who is actually someone researching the polls um, in, the, in the UK. Uh, so we do have basically civil society. However, I wanted to ask you the collective question, um, what is going to be the role of the Polish people in the UK? Apart from the sectors, um, I'm thinking about uh, political lobbies, for example, participation in labor movement, you know, these sort of things which very often constitute actually yardsticks, um, testifying basically to the, to, the political, uh, to the political position of a specific ethnic minority um, in the UK. So this is the, this is the collective question to all of you. And the second question has to do with the COVID. Uh, with the pandemic, um, it's not a secret that Poland itself actually had relatively low levels uh, of vaccination, and I would like to I would like you actually to reflect on the on this specific condition among members of the Polish um, community um, in 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 Britain, because obviously I have my own personal uh, observations. I live in North London. Um, but I'm not a social researcher, so I would like to actually uh, learn more about uh, the personal and collective responses actually to, to the pandemic, apart from uh, various forms of aid um, and grassroots initiatives actually, which really help the community during this trying time. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to answer eight questions, can we just have one more? Uh, on? Yeah, Anna. Right. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of this, so you may have already covered it, but I think my question is um, very interesting what we've just heard, but I, I, um, a question about sort of the Polish diaspora, the Polish people in, in the UK and looking back into Poland, and sort of what, I mean, it's slightly a factual question really, about the degree to which Polish politicians are engaging Polish communities here, or the degree that Polish communities here want to shape uh, politics in Poland. And I just wondered if you could, just sort of out of interest, your, your perspectives on that sort of, that bridge question really between our two countries. Thank you. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, who would like to start? Um, Professor White, would you like to go ahead first? Uh. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I guess the um, thing about Brexit is that it's, um, it's made it more difficult, obviously, for more Polish people to come to the UK, so the Poles who are already here are becoming more and more sort of settled and integrated and all the rest of it. And so in that sense, maybe they don't have such specific interest to defend in, in the way that they did, well, even at the time of the referendum, as Barbara was talking about, with the, the hate crime and all the rest of it. But uh, it's, it's, it's harder to say what is a specifically Polish cause nowadays. But I think that this leads on to what Anna was saying, that basically, you know, that, that we also have to consider Poland vis-a-vis -vis the UK, vis UK vis-a-vis -vis Poland, because what is specific about Polish people in the UK often now is the fact well, that they are intensely tied to people in Poland and many people are still very uh, anxious about what happens in Poland and, and they feel that they're part of the same causes. This morning we heard about how in, um, even in Polish small towns there were um, protests against the changes to the abortion law. Well, there were protests in small towns in the UK as well, weren't there? So, you know, it's, it goes to show that there is such a thing as Polish society, which is based in Poland, but somehow also spills out across the borders of Poland and is present in the UK and there are many people in the UK who still feel that they are somehow members of Polish society even though they live here. So I guess it's that kind of dual identity that many people have which is going to shape their particular response and this is very well illustrated by the response to the, to the invasion of Ukraine which is what you were talking about Magda. So people in what, what is specifically Polish, a Polish cause in the UK. Well, interestingly, the specifically Polish cause is the Ukraine cause. I mean, not the Ukraine, but Ukraine, but the Ukrainian cause. That is what it is because people are so bound up in what's happening in Poland and the refugee flood exodus into Poland. And as you say, the whole sort of sense of being equally sort of uh, anti-Russian or, you know, having a commonly shared history, etc. So that is a very interesting example of how people 
Poles in the UK are therefore getting involved in exactly the same cause as Poles in Poland. In other words, they're part of that same kind of transnational space. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara, Magda, uh, do you have a sense of where the Polish community is heading? I mean, as uh, uh, leaders of particular community-based organizations, uh, just to answer and address Miko uh, questions, what, what do you think is, is next? And, and if nothing is next, so to speak, uh, if the uncertainty is ahead of us, what would be the barriers that we have to address in order to participate more uh, proactively in uh, public life in UK? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think I might, might just very quickly, I mean, in terms of, in terms of role of, of Polish diaspora or Polish community in UK, I think that sort of looking a little bit bigger picture wise, I mean, I think that one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the roles that, that we might be playing is being the bridge between the UK and Europe seen as a sort of by the nature of sort of by the nature of the Polish, po Polish um, spirit. So if you, if you look at the fact that Poles are not only quite mobile people, but also they are very avid entrepreneurs. And they, one of the, one of the biggest fears when we were speaking with people, with Poles after the referendum in, in the period running up to now, is essentially the freedom, economic freedom that, that, is, that, that has been under threat with the withdrawing from EU. So just, just the simple sheer fact of, of, of retaining strong economic exchange, but also exchange of, of, of family exchange, exchange of ideas, even this forum that is rather quite, I would imagine, unique, and build this bridge very explicitly is, I think, one of the, one of the kind of high-level roles that we might be aspiring to, to, to be placing. But also one of the reasons is that we are not in competition. <laughs> So Poland and the UK is not competing states as it could be seen with other members of the EU, for example, and Britain. Um, and I think that there is a future in it. There is a future in it. There are joint interests um, in it. In terms of diaspora itself, I think that we need to, the role for us, uh, us as a, as, a, as a community is, is to, is to keep on identifying those areas where we need to be visible, vocal, and active, because we not only represent ourselves, and that is, and I'm not saying that because I'm Polish and I'm big-headed, I'm saying this because this is evidenceable in history, that, our, that we tend to, by sheer effect of numbers possibly, we do kind of lead away in, in, in areas that that way might need that door might need to be opened. And I think that we are um, at the stage where this participation is really becoming explicit and very visible. And I certainly hope that this is where we are going. OK, uh, fantastic. Magda, any thoughts on barriers uh, to participation or a future direction or pathways that Poles can exploit in order to uh, integrate in a more constructive, productive, well, I, think, yeah, I think we are, show, we, we are starting to show ourselves as a strong nation with a strong opinion, strong identity, and with high working uh, ethics. And this is where I think it's quite important that uh, people in Europe will see us not <coughs> as the cheapest labor, but the people who've got the really good working basis and morals and ethics and that in the time of crisis you can always depend on you can count on us but we are always ready for action and we are just not looking after our own interest but we are also trying to benefit wherever we live we are trying to bring the benefit into local uh, communities but we are not takers but we are our givers and sure. we that, that's how I. That's how I see it. And with um, a slightly disagree. I, no, I strongly disagree with what Professor Ann said. But we are anti-Russian. I don't think we are anti-Russians. I don't think we. Uh, I think we are pro-peace and we are pro-independence. And that has nothing to do whether it is Russia, Germany, France, or whoever. I think what we are trying to show that we will fight for our independence and other countries' independence. That's how I see it. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, Aga, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, I try to answer on Mikoy questions in terms of uh, um, the role of uh, political um, influence. I think it's really important uh, from my point of view only personally because it's very personal view and answer. I start saying that 
Polish mentality, it's definitely <coughs> not the same as the European or British. Uh, we have quite close thinking where we not necessarily want to share or have an um, aspiration to change something, but not necessarily feel strong enough to do it, or like to say, mm, they did, uh, looking at the different communities, they achieved something, they have more represented, um, they ask for uh, space, they got it, uh, we are biggest one, we are most uh, hurt, why we don't have the same um, possibilities to have this, the, uh, the same kind of benefits to be involved in, co in local um, communities or political aspiration. It's all about us, how we see ourselves. Unfortunately, as a Poles, we quite often like to talk a lot about things we would like to have but not necessarily willing to do that first step, which I keep talking constantly from my uh, first speech. And uh, this is how I see us, Poles, in the uh, current situation. However, going back to um, Anna questions about shaping um, politics uh, abroad, I think it's quite, it's very ambitious. Currently, it's very challenging by the simple fact that we are living in completely different culture. We're facing different uh, challenges and so we're acknowledging a different future and approach. However, engaging with local, uh, engaging with ambassador in the places where you live is really important. And that's the pathway and possibility and the way to try shape or give a signal to. Uh, politician abroad, how perhaps they should change direction or approach to some important aspect of life, people who decided to live abroad. Okay. Uh, we had another question from Mikowai specifically about uh, COVID. Uh, oh, yeah. What evidence, academic evidence perhaps, or uh, evidence produced by professional uh, research organizations, if any, uh, you are aware about, uh, ways in which uh, Polish community kind of address the issues of vaccination, perhaps issues of disinformation uh, and, and misinformation during a COVID period and how susceptible Poles were to, uh, to information, disinformation around that. Can I start? Um, For change? Absolutely. You, you don't mind? Yeah, I, I don't. forgot. <laughs> uh, as a community portfolio holder, it was quite a huge challenge to try and encourage and engage Polish community to participate in uh, um, a local vaccination center, and it's still the challenge. In my town, uh, sadly, Polish community is the lowest taker still. They are constantly keep um, saying a quite, uh, and from my point of view, I cannot understand the explanation behind that, but I will be very honest. The main uh, reason why they uh, saying no to vaccination is to bring history back, and exactly Auschwitz. Sorry. Yes. Oh, wow. oh. This is how they see in it uh, with the current situation and the reason why they saying no. In that situation and that example exactly, the, the fact what is shared, and it was in the past abroad in Polish TV, on the radio or newspaper, which they read or heard, make them think that if my broad and butter country saying that is not good, mm. I shouldn't take it. I still am I'm Polish. I live in a different country, but I'm broad and bred abroad in my hometown. And my hometown, my GP, my um, uncle, uh, mom saying, don't do it. And I would. Okay, uh, thank you. Do we have any views from remaining panelists on this particular issue? No, I just I just wanted to mention very quickly that we have been involved with uh, with what used to be for Public Health England and other kind of bodies that have been renamed in the progress. 
in, 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 in campaigns, bringing, for example, foreign speaking GPs to, to events, online events, and so on. And actually, that really worked because people could ask very, very questions that they were really worried to ask elsewhere because they felt that they would be judged about the, the sheer fact that I may have doubts. Having said that, we are at, until, until this day, we work with certain local authorities in London on very particular targeted information campaigns which are kind of, we are sort of fighting with time in regards to the potential next wave of COVID that is sort of brewing there. And there is certain level still of, but I think that it is mainly, as, as with many things relating health, welfare and well-being of Polish community, it's kind of access to information really, that is a make or break of welfare of, of minority community. And I think that this is, there is some progress, but Great, uh, thank you. Um, Mikoya, I'm just gonna add really briefly, and obviously I'm happy to talk about it. There is a project at the University of Sheffield uh, which specifically focuses on ways in which uh, polls mm -hmm. responded to public campaigning around uh, appeals to vaccinate. Uh, I, in preparation for this panel, because I knew that the question, or I suspected that the question might come up, uh, I reached out to principal investigator. She's on uh, annual leave, the findings of this project uh, have not been written up yet, but I'm more than happy to pass on the name uh, later on. Um, I'm mindful of the time, and I'm also mindful of the fact that everyone is really, really, really looking forward to lunch. Uh, so let's just address the last question from uh, Anna. Uh, and uh, this is a question about the unique position of Polish people uh, within, uh, as in between us, between national politics in Poland and British politics. What do you think significance of that particular position of the Polish community is? Professor White? I mean, we need to do a lot more, a lot more research needs to be done about the, about the engagement of Polish people in the UK in Polish politics and about voting patterns and so forth. I mean, I, I don't think I have anything particularly to add. I mean, obviously, some people are more engaged than others, and the, the, generally speaking, the results for voters here tend to be not absolutely typical of the results Poland-wide. Um, but uh, yeah, I won't say any more. May I have two sentences? Sure, absolutely. My personal yeah. observation, no research, just personal observation. I think a lot of Polish people who are here, they have left Poland due to being unhappy with the political situation for several years. And no matter what governments are uh, ruling, the citizens are still not happy. And I think those that have left are not interested in changing and influencing politics, and they are waiting for something to change, and maybe then they would go back to Poland. That's how I see it, talking to my friends who have been here. People just want to be politically neutral, and they believe that one day, there will be a government or party that will change something and the situation in Poland will change. But that's my personal view. Okay, uh, we've got one more question. I, I suppose we are allowed to do that because the previous panel overrun, so I'm just gonna <laughs> use the <laughs> privilege of a chair to make that uh, executive decision. Uh, uh, thank you, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Hello, please go hi, ahead. my name's Kasia. And I have a question because we've talked a lot about how Poles living in the UK see themselves here, and what we need to do, what, how to show off, and, and so on. And what's the perception of Poles within the international community, because it's not just the Brits, but all the communities here around, has it changed since referendum or since 2004? How it has evolved from um, hardworking people coming here just you know, to find a new world for themselves, and, um, and, and, and what's your opinion in, in your, all your fields? Like, Great. Thanks. I can start. Uh, um, Post always had a label. <clears throat> they started coming to UK with label. And I always wanted to break those stereotypes and shows that whatever you uh, thinking that uh, they can only, uh, with my full respect to every each, per, every each person who decided to start the life in UK uh, from lower level and go up and up, uh, it's important to shape ourselves in the way how we would like to be seen. 
And uh, for some people, it's easier to do. For some people, it's easier to say than do. But I definitely see, and uh, to some extent, agree with uh, Magda about the second generation. What the message I think from all of us across is we are the second generation. And we want to make those changes visible. The history will be always behind us. And we will be proud of the history what Poles made in UK and, and around the world. But we are the second generation. And we have a willingness to shape it in the way how we, we would like to create a future for our children. And this is how I see it. Uh, evolution of police in the UK across many, many years. Um, without support of each other, without encouraging each other, without standing and uh, talking about it, never ever will change. Uh, Professor Roy, do you see those labels being broken down? Uh, do they still play uh, a significant role in discourse, public discourse about Poles in, in this country? Well, I don't know. It's very difficult to talk about public discourse about Poles. I know that Polish people are often very um, sort of self-conscious about it and about the image of Poland and Poles. But then, you know, the average British person never probably thinks about Poles from one day to the next. <laughs> I had a, I had a, a PhD student um, who's actually, she's actually Romanian, but she may know her, Alexandra Bulat, because she's also a counsellor. So she, she did her PhD about Poles, Romanians, and British people's attitudes towards EU migrants and it was extraordinary how superficial people's knowledge was and how people yeah. came up with attitudes almost on the spur of the moment if they were asked to have them mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's true of a lot of posts so say there would be times obviously around the time of the referendum or you know even before then when there would be a lot in the Daily Mail or whatever about polls I think eventually actually though it was the Romanians who ended up being the chief targets so that Romanians have had a much worse time than Roma. <coughs> Romanians have had the worst time of all if we're talking about being stigmatized. But, but nowadays, I, mean, I don't know, I mean, like Poles, I mean, there are so many kinds of Polish people and they make an impact in different kinds of ways yeah. and things like that. That kind of collective Polish identity and memory, I know it's very important to, to many Polish people and particularly like Saturday school activists or people who've got some kind of role in maintaining that identity mm. and, and to really treasure it and think it's very important. Yeah. But, you know, that's the same with, with any group of people who have come to a, a new country and, and, and have that kind of sense of collective identity that they think is important. But it doesn't mean that the people who they meet, who are not from that group, are necessarily going to think it's important. The crucial people, it seems to be, are the people who then marry into that community or, or simply are partners. So then you have to take all these people right on the periphery, as it were, who, who started off you know, not being Polish, but now are sort of honorary Polish because they're part of Polish families. And I think we need to find out more about those people and more research needs to be done about them. Yeah. Probably more needs to be done for them to help them be integrated into that Polish population, for want of a better word. Okay, fantastic. And on that positive note, mm -hmm. I would like to close the session. Uh, thank you to our excellent speakers for enlightening insights. Uh, thanks for all the questions, for remarks and comments. Um, and uh, let's continue this conversation in an informal fashion over lunch. Thank you, Thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs>